Let's talk about the most depressing chapter in the entire Bible. Doesn't that sound fun? It is going to be fun. This is going to be a good video. I highly encourage you to watch it the whole way through and hit the like button so we can destroy the YouTube algorithm that hates people like me and hates a message like mine. Not my message, God's message. Okay, so check this out. The most depressing chapter out of the entire Bible is found in Psalm chapter 88. Okay, it is unlike any other Psalm. And I really think it's unlike any other chapter of Scripture because from verse 1 to the very end, there is nothing nice about it. This dude that wrote this Psalm is absolutely in a depressed state. And it's important that you and I know it and read it and understand it because, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's important because we're all going to be in this guy's situation at one point or another. And maybe you have been, and maybe you are right now. It's a matter of time. So it's written by this guy, um, He-Man, the Ezraite. And basically in Psalm 88, he pours his heart out to God in absolute lament. Nothing is going right. He says his soul is full of trouble. He cries out to God day and night. He feels like he has not heard. He feels like the wrath of God is upon him. Because things around the nation are going so horribly. We can probably identify with that. His eyes are grow dim through sorrow. He feels like he's almost in a grave. Okay, this, this guy's life is in a shambles. And at the very end, the, the most depressing verse of the entire chapter is at the very end where it says, you have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. So after all of his troubles, the people closest to him that he loves the most that supposedly love him the most, have shunned him. And he says, and this is a great line. Okay, it's a great line. My companions have become darkness. What a poet, right? What a great closing line, however horrible it is. My companions have become darkness. And then the psalm is over. Now, I'm bringing this up because... Like I said in the beginning, at some point in your life, you're going to feel exactly like this guy. And I have personally been there. And what pulled me through it is basically turning the page. You read Psalm 88 and you're like, life freaking sucks. You got to turn the page. That's my instruction here. That's, that's ultimately... I think a big reason why this psalm even exists. And the lesson is you got to turn the page on it. And what do you turn the page to when you are down and out, when your heart is nothing but, but darkness and trouble? What do you do in that situation? You've got to turn the page. You turn the page to Psalm 89 and it's going to make it all better. Now, I'm not saying that all of your troubles don't go away. I'm not saying all of your sorrows go away. Some things you live with for the rest of your life. Um, you know, you lose a child. You lose a spouse. You lose your best friend. Man, that hurt will never go away. Those scars will always be there for the rest of your life. That's just the way it is. But you don't have to live in a state of perpetual affliction and depression. You absolutely don't have to live there. And there are many stories of people who read a Psalm like Psalm 89 and they pull themselves out of it because I'm going to show you right here what, what ultimately pulls you out of living in a depressed, horrified state of existence where everything sucks and every cloud in the sky is dark. I'm going to show you how to pull out of that. Because that's a miserable way to live. So, Psalm 89. Let's turn the page from 88. And he says, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. 
With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Now, when you talk about the steadfast love of the Lord forever, I think that we can, as Western Christians, I'm in the West. If you're in another country outside the West, I'm glad you're here. But a lot of us think very broadly about the steadfast love of the Lord. And it's like this, this kind of big thing up in the sky. And it's like, well, what, what is the real direction of that statement? Okay, he's going to break it down for us. He says, speaking of this steadfast love, he says, you have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. That is, what's up, buddy? That is the statement that is centered on the steadfast love of the Lord. And I'm telling you right now, a lot of people don't know what in the world he just said. But you've got to. You have got to understand this because it will pull you from the depths of Psalm 88 into your, your focus of the steadfast love of the Lord. And it has a direction and it has a purpose and it has a really awesome meaning. It is a promise to King David from God. And that is what Ethan, the Ezraite, decides to focus it on. So he says, I have sworn to David, my offspring, I will establish, or David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. The direction of God's steadfast love is found in his promise to King David, where he told King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you've got to read that passage, you got to know it, you got to understand it. He told David, I am promising you, David, my servant, that you will have a throne through all generations. It's an eternal throne. It, the throne will sit on my holy hill of Mount Zion. It will reside there. It will be inhabited by the anointed son of David for all of eternity. And he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he will have dominion and domination over the entire universe. That is the promise. And, you know, these guys that wrote Psalm 88 and Psalm 89, they lived in crazy times. And their, their focus inside of their existence was to remember the promise made to David. Some of these guys were contemporaries of David. They, were, they lived in his time and then some lived after his time. And as, as time progressed on and David's dead and gone, and then Israel's being ruled by crappy kings. That's how these guys got through those times. They go, this guy sucks. He needs to be ejected from office. But what do we have to do? We have to focus on the fact that God made a promise to David. And we trust that God is going to carry through with his promise to David. That he's going to put someone on the throne that will be a righteous ruler. That will rule all nations. That will be completely unflawed. Perfect. We trust that he's going to do that. It alludes to something here in Psalm 89 that's quite predictive and very special. There's a verse in here. It says, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. I think the guy in Psalm 88 should have been reminded of that. That God rules the raging of the sea. And when its waves are raging, God is the one who stills them. And you see that when the son of David comes down to planet earth. When Jesus Christ is born and you read his genealogy and you go, hey, this guy is a son of David. He can inhabit the throne of David. And what does he do? One of the things that Jesus Christ did when he was on planet earth the sea was raging. It could not be tamed. And yet he said, be still. Remember all the disciples in the boat? They felt at that point in time, when that sea was raging, they felt like they were living inside of Psalm 88. And they finally get Jesus woken up. 
and he says, peace be still, and he calms the storm. And so the object of God's steadfast love is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And he sent him here to be the page turner, getting us away from Psalm 88 and focusing us on Psalm 89. So, hey, if your life sucks, if it's in a shambles right now, if you're dealing with major heartache and loss and just downright tough times, I get it. I understand it. I've been there. Sometimes I am there. But you can't dwell there. You've got to move past that. You have got to get yourself to turn the page and to focus your attention on the promise that was made to David. When you focus yourself on his promise, you are focusing on the fact that Jesus Christ is the culmination of that promise. That he, has, that he has come, that he exists, that he has been here and that he's coming back. And when you focus on that, it gives you a grand picture of the entire universe. And you go, dude, here's where it started in Genesis 1. Here it's going to finish at the end of Revelation. I'm somewhere in between and I realize my life is difficult right now. Things are not going my way. But I understand that Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne of David on Mount Zion. And I'm going to wait for that. And that's all I've got to focus on. And that's all I've got to hope for. For those of you that don't understand that, that don't believe in that, I hope you'll give it a try. Like, I, I hope that you'll think about it. Crack the Bible open, start reading it. You know, if, if you're not there in your heart, there's probably not too much I can say to, to convince you otherwise. Um, but yet you may be still living in that Psalm 88 kind of mentality where it's just like, man, my life is, a, is just destroyed. It's nothing but destruction all around me. And I feel the heavy hand of God upon me. I understand that. And... The only thing I can tell you is you've got to focus upon Jesus Christ. He will brighten your day. So, most depressing chapter of the Bible. There you go. And what to do with it. You turn that page.